As cities grow and land is developed, a problem is presented. How do we protect our nature and the unique animals that live here? This is the Caucasus Nature Reserve where they are cultivating an innovative program to re-release leopards into the wild. I'm Sean Thomas, this is Inland Visions, and today we are in the mountains of Krasnaya Poliana. The Caucasus Nature Reserve is one of a kind with its huge territory and diverse wildlife. Sergei Shevilov is the director here. He has spent his life in the forests of the reserve. It's his life's work, and he's with us today to show us what it's all about. Sergei, thank you for meeting me out here. It's going to be interesting to learn what you do. So first, let's start off. Tell me, you've been doing this job for a long time as a park ranger. Tell me how you got into this job and what exactly do you do? I've worked in this reserve for 40 years and I've been in the mountains since I turned 16. I've worked in tourism, taking tourists through the nature reserve who specialize in mountain tourism. I've climbed Mount Elbrus. I'm all about the mountains. My work as a forest ranger for four years, then I studied. I became a forest engineer. So I've been through all the levels up to the director. What's interesting is that I'm the 21st director here in 99 years, and I've been in this position for 20 years. My predecessor worked 15 years. So the average stint of the other 19 directors before that was two or three years. The work here is very difficult because the territory is really big. Right now, we're number one in the country in terms of visitors, but we don't let tourists go deep inside the reserve. What we did is create recreational facilities around the perimeter. 100,000 people visited the nature reserve last year around the perimeter, and another 400,000 spent time near the reserve. So practically no damage was done to nature. Talk to me a little bit about the dangers of your job um, and if you have any stories to share. In 2017, we marked 100 years of the nature reserve system. In those 100 years since the system was created, 103 nature reserves have been created and 57 people have died across the whole country. 16 of them in the Caucasus nature reserve. That's 30%. That's a very big number. These people were killed by poachers or drowned at stream crossings or took a deadly fall when on duty. 16 people, that's a lot. So I consider our work quite dangerous. When I became director, there was a lot of poaching, mostly outside the nature reserve limits. We've actually seized very few guns in the reserve. It's mainly working around the perimeter. After that, more people began to engage in anti-poaching campaigns. And so today, there's no poaching in the nature reserve. Now, the only poachers are tourists who catch a snake, pick a redless plant, catch a caterpillar, or some wagtail bird. That's also poaching. If you take a newt away from the forest, that's also damage. We're working to stop that now. This place is really big, about 280,000 hectares. How do you protect such a vast area from people and from whom are you protecting the area? There are 16 ranger stations around the perimeter of the nature reserve. People live there all year round, three to four families at one location. That's their home in the mountains. The nature reserve is split into ranges. We have 48 ranges here, supervised by 48 rangers, each of them responsible for one area. So in general, talking about control and protection, you have good communications here, but there are no roads in the nature reserve. You can't get in here by car. You can only hike or take a horse. So although it's not easy to protect, it does have its advantages. Now, Sergey, I understand that there's a place a little bit higher that you want to take us to. Shall we go? Let's go to the Alpine Meadows okay. now. Now we know not far from us right now there is a bear, uh, as you pointed out. What other kind of um, interesting animals are here in the reserve? There is huge animal diversity here. The European bison, deer, tur, chamois, jackal, bear, wolf, fox, wild boar, and so on. Next year, we're marking the 100th anniversary of the Caucasus Nature Reserve. It was created specifically to preserve the population of the European bison. The first one was caught in the Caucasus in 1856. The animal wasn't known back then, so they took it to the St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences, where it was dubbed Dombey. 
This word means bison in translation. The last bison was spotted in the Caucasus in 1927. Later in 1936, a pure-blooded European bison nicknamed Kavkaz was found in Germany and returned to Russia. But there were no female animals. So nine female bison were taken from a nature reserve in Ukraine to create a population here. Today, we have 1,200 European bison here, so we managed to preserve this species. Ecotourism is becoming more and more popular here, with crowds of tourists heading to the reserve with the start of each season. But how do you make sure everyone's safe? How do you keep people from encroaching into the territories that are supposed to be home to some of the world's rarest species? Olga Pegova is the deputy director of the Caucasus Nature Reserve. She's with us today to provide some perspective. Olga, hello. Hello. Thank you for meeting me out here to help us understand this beautiful place. Can animals and humans actually coexist or will humans always be a threat? Is there a way to strike a balance? That's a very complicated question because animals are always put under stress in the presence of humans. We see in the nature reserve that people don't know how to interact with wild animals. People are either very afraid of them or become aggressive. Or we see in local settlements that people pay little attention to their garbage, attracting wild animals. This changes the animal's behavior and they become more aggressive. They don't behave like they would in the wild. The first question tourists ask when they come to the nature reserve is if we have bears here. And we say, yes, we do. And they ask, and what should we do? We want to hike along this route and you have bears all around. And we keep explaining to people that wild animals are normal and healthy. And if their habitats and behavior are not influenced by humans, they will never attack a tourist, a person who is just walking by. The scariest animals in the mountains are probably humans themselves themselves because they don't know how to behave properly. We're only starting to develop ecotourism, helping people learn more about nature and how to preserve it. Now, nature reserves like this need space, and it seems to me that uh, there's always going to be people building and infringing on that space, for example, hotels and tourist areas. Is that a problem? And how do you uh, combat that? It has become a problem because hotels and resorts have advanced practically up to the reserve's boundaries. The biggest issue is that we don't have the opportunity to educate tourists, to make sure that they know there is a nature reserve nearby, that they shouldn't play loud music or leave garbage, tell them to only walk along the trails in certain areas. We simply can't manage it. There's a lot of people and the resorts don't adequately inform their guests about their surroundings. And of course, this impacts on the animals, causing them to move deeper into the nature reserve. If this continues, the nature reserve will wind up being like an island, and then the chance of preserving wildlife here for another 100 or 200 years will be diminished. So now our director and colleagues are saying that it's important to create green corridors between nature reserves, to leave space that's not occupied by people, roads or resorts, so that animals can move freely and these different species cross paths. Kind of an extreme answer, is it possible just to lock the area off and keep people out completely? In the 50s and 60s, and even when nature reserves were just being set up at the beginning of the previous century, there was the idea of turning them into sanctuaries, close off the area, prevent people from coming in, stick to science and preserve the animals. But it didn't stand up to criticism because, when people don't know what's happening on a certain territory, they become hostile towards it, and so that hinders preserving everything. We've opened less than 3% of our territory to visitors. That's almost 400 kilometers of trails that people can hike on, and they have the opportunity to see all the climatic zones, mountains, forests, the highest points and glaciers. When people see the alpine meadows in bloom, the colors changing every two weeks, they are inspired by this, they begin to love this and become our assistants in preserving nature. If we lock up, we're going to lose these people. So here, finding this balance is very important. Well, you mentioned uh, that there are different routes that tourists can take, but tourists and people in general can, uh, let's say, 
be a little bit stupid sometimes. They try and go around the paths and find their own ways. Um, are you finding yourself in the position to have to go and rescue these tourists sometimes? Yes, sometimes we save these tourists because most of the tragic or dramatic situations in the nature reserve occur when people leave the trails, don't follow the rules. But thankfully, in the last few years, there have been few extreme situations. We generally manage to find people and have a talk with them. I believe people aren't stupid or intend to violate the rules. The main reason this usually happens is because they don't know why they can't do certain things. But when you explain it, they are motivated not to do this anymore. Well, you mentioned people don't have the proper or no, they don't always have the proper information. Um, I heard you once talk about a story of a bear coming into a tent mm -hmm. because the bear wanted a chocolate bar yeah. and the people didn't know to keep their food separate. Do you have any other stories like that? We had this story repeat two years ago, last year. There are several places in the nature reserve that are very popular with tourists. These are also places where bears traditionally live and there are young bears that aren't as smart as the older ones and they don't know it's not a good idea to approach people. And like teenagers, they're curious. These bears come to tourist camping spots and naturally are attracted to the smell of food. We inform tourists that they need to store food away from where they sleep, hang them on a tree or put them in some kind of closed space at the camping site, if there is one. But incidents still happen. One happened two years ago when a girl had two chocolate bars in her backpack and a young bear came. He only took the backpack, he carried it off. We found it not far from the campsite, so these things happen. And it's not the bear's fault. Persian leopards once roamed this area, until humans came. Saved from the brink of extinction, the Persian leopard is now slowly but steadily returning to the place that is its rightful home. So there are only about a thousand Persian leopards left in the world. How many of them are here in this reserve? The last time a Persian leopard was spotted here in the wild was in 1984. After that, they disappeared. In 2008, a leopard reintroduction program was launched. Today, we have only three leopards in the nature reserve. The main problem we have is that the leopards don't stay here. They leave the reserve's boundaries. There's a lot of snow here, and the leopards are not that good at hunting big prey, so they move to places inhabited by raccoons, jackals, badgers, and small rodents. We monitor them using wildlife camera traps. Right now, we're scheduled to release the female leopard into the wild, so we've decided to put her outside the reserve where our three male leopards already live. It seems to me it's all about balance. And what I mean is there was a time when the leopards were not in this region, and reintroducing them to the region is also kind of changing the way uh, nature works. Is this an intrusion into nature as well? Or are you worried about that type of an intrusion? I don't think it's an intrusion. Why? There is a very high density of animal populations here. We have 1,800 deer, 2,000 tours, and 1,300 chamois. So a place was chosen where we wouldn't disrupt the animal balance. Besides, the leopards now live outside the nature reserve, as I said, mainly feeding on small rodents. So how does the process work when you reintroduce a leopard or any animal back into the wild? How do you know where to let them go? How do you know if they're ready to be released? Uh, that's interesting to me. We have a scientific division at the Nature Reserve, a team including seven PhDs and two professors. We have a breeding station located in the Sochi National Park where the animals are kept in enclosures. They're born and live there for two years while we train them for the wild. After two years, they're released into the Nature Reserve, but we chose the best suited places for that, of course, areas with little snow and high animal density. Last time, we released the leopards right in the center of the Nature Reserve. This year, we've changed our plan following recommendations from our science division. We keep monitoring the process all year round, dispatching monitoring missions every month, using camera traps to spot places with more animals. So this year, we're going to release the leopards outside the reserve. One of the most impressive programs here in the nature reserve 
the introduction of the Persian leopard, and hopefully we'll get to meet some of its residents. Nikolai Vronin is the head of the center, and he will show us around. Nikolai, thanks for giving us the opportunity to come here to your office and experience this leopard firsthand. Um, everyone in the entire world is looking at this specific reserve and what you're doing here. What makes your program so unique? What makes our project here unique is that no one else has been able to make as much progress in reintroducing large predators into their natural habitat. There have been some attempts to restore the population of lions in Africa, but the problem was that those lions, once they were reintroduced into the wild, would usually die. We, on the other hand, have been able to breed new leopards from adult wild animals in our center, and we raise them in a way to make them prepared to survive in the wild on their own. We released our first generation of leopards in 2016, and they have been able to survive on their own ever since. One key achievement is that they avoid meeting people. Despite the fact that the Caucasus is densely populated, our leopards do not come to households to prey on domesticated animals. Instead, they hunt into the wild, even though it gets really hard in winter when snow can be up to one meter thick. Nonetheless, they're still capable of adapting, and that's a very important component of their survival in the wild. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that it takes a lot of area to be able to do what you do. Can you give me an idea of the, the size of this place, the scope? That's actually the most important question. As our boss used to say, the most important thing in our work is infrastructure. Without it, we won't be able to prepare the animals effectively for survival in the wild. Our territory is currently 12 hectares, and we have a number of sectors dedicated to different functions. We have our headquarters, where we can control all the processes remotely. As you can see, all animal sectors are equipped with video cameras, and we can remotely do things like open the gates for the leopards to go through or feed them, also remotely. We've accumulated enough experience to be able to control them hunting large hoofed animals remotely. We have hunting sectors, we observe everything via surveillance cameras, and make adjustments whenever necessary in the training program for each individual leopard. If I may ask, uh, where do your leopards come from? This is another very important issue. It's actually one of the key things because in order to form a new population in the wild, we need to release specimens of different genetic backgrounds. So one important thing we do here is try to obtain as many new mothers. Despite the fact that some of the parent animals are from zoos, the baby leopards have all the necessary instincts for survival in the wild, and our job here is to help them develop those instincts. Our main job here, at this center, is to artificially stimulate natural instincts. We are not inventing anything new here, we simply create conditions for these predators to be able to follow their instincts and succeed. Mm -hmm. Now, the animals that come from the zoo parks, the zoos themselves, they can't be released into the wild, can they? Because they're already spoiled for that kind of life. You're absolutely right. We had a case when the Parc de Feling in France donated us a young leopard, two years old, and they said that it had been kept separately and had no contact with people whatsoever. So presumably it was wild. But we had our doubts about it and ran a series of tests here to see how it would behave. And we found out that the animal wasn't able to hunt, wasn't afraid of people and couldn't interact with other leopards. We spent a year training him. He finally started he started hunting and realized he's a leopard, not a human. He started marking territory, scratching, rubbing, urinating, but we seemed to have trouble getting him to avoid people consistently. Every now and then he would start showing interest in humans trying to approach us. Before we release the animals into the wild, we run a series of very demanding tests. And when we tested him for human interaction, 
That's when we act as a group of tourists approaching the leopard area. That leopard got excited and came out to interact. He was like, oh, finally, there are some fun people in bright clothes, not those mean people in green uniform. So he failed the test, because an animal like this in the wild can only create further conflict. We decided to keep him for breeding, found him a mate, and were expecting that couple to have new cubs very soon. The processes that are taking place at our facility, from the moment the cubs are born till they are released, including training, procedures, stimulation of social activities, it all happens under video camera surveillance. If we see that behavioral corrections are required at a certain stage, or when we see that an animal is afraid of humans, if it's shy or physically weak, or just sly and prefers to wait till an animal from another litter hunts down a deer, that's when we give an animal special hunting training sessions, training it to hunt down the kinds of prey that are easy to track down and get close to, but hard to wrestle down. For example, a wild boar is a powerful animal, low slung, with short legs and a short neck. While wrestling down a deer, for example, takes a leopard about two minutes, getting down a boar can take up to 30 or 40 minutes. And it's the kind of fitness that turns two-year-old cubs into real beasts, ready to take on any mountain in the Caucasus. So, Nikolai, we know that the leopards are safe here in this environment, um, but does this kind of give them a safe sense of security? Because when they're released into the wild, uh, will they be safe out there? It's important to realize that the main danger to leopards in the wild comes from us, humans. It's a factor that is not related to natural processes. For example, in the wild, it's perfectly normal that a predator can die in an avalanche. It's out there looking for something. An avalanche goes down, the animal dies. It's normal and it can happen to any being. Human-related factors, however, are regulated and our job here, all our efforts, are aimed at developing the reflex of avoiding humans. Nikolai, it's been incredibly fascinating to learn what you do, but also to watch what these leopards do. Thank you very much for the experience. Yulia, thank you for bringing me here to this control center where you can really see all of the leopards um, out in the reserve. Um, I've heard that these leopards take exams. So what kind of exams do they take? How can a leopard take a test? Uh, All the animals set for wild release are supposed to pass a test that allows us to be sure that the animal can live in the wild. It examines their attitude towards humans and to any livestock that can be herded by humans. The second test is hunting. We set up several hunts and see how the leopards attack their prey, how they hunt it down, whether they are capable of hunting in the wild at all, and how feasible it is for them in the wild. So what happens if a leopard fails an exam? Has it ever been the case where you haven't been able to send them out into the wild? Of course, we will not release an animal that can't survive in the wild. Such animals stay in our center forever and are used for breeding in most cases. For example, Aibga here failed her test because she was too curious for humans. So she stays here with us. Um, if I may ask, uh, sitting in here and looking at the different leopards, it seems to me that you'll develop a relationship with them. Uh, so what are your emotions when you see them sent into the wild? Is, are you sad? Are you happy? Is it a mix of both? Of course, yes. They're like family to us. We know them all. We know their peculiarities. For example, fish hates certain food, so we give him only the food they like. We vaccinate them, groom them, and look after their health. They're like little kids to us. So when they are released in the wild, it's always an intense moment with loss of emotions. Firstly, there's joy for having achieved the result. It's a major program that greatly benefits the future of our country's environment. But besides that, we become so attached to the animals that it's sad to realize that we won't be seeing them again soon, if ever. Julia, thank you very much for taking the time to show us this. It's kind of cool that we get to hang out with leopards here in this environment, so appreciate it. Thank you.
You can argue preserving the biodiversity of our planet should be among our top priorities globally. And it is reassuring to know that set against this stunning scenery are beautiful people doing this important work. It is a difficult task, but a rewarding one, all leading up to priceless and emotional moments like this one. Another leopard is returning to its proper home in the Caucasus Mountains.